Hey, this is Joe from Home Studio Corner. Have you seen the new Batman movie? There's two parts in that movie where they use the song from Nirvana's album, Nevermind, the um, Underneath the Bridge song. Underneath the bridge in the... Anyway, have you heard the story of how that song was recorded? Uh, I got goosebumps just right now because it's such a cool song and it does really it suits that movie really well. Um, the apparently they were in the studio trying to record. I saw I watched the Sound City documentary again recently, and um, I think it was Butch Vig was telling the story where they couldn't get it right, couldn't get the sound they wanted, and they took a break. And Kurt Cobain comes into the control room and just lays on the couch like on his back and has the little some sort of five string guitar and he just starts singing the song and uh, and Butch says that's it that's what I want so he gets mics turns off stuff with that makes noise and fans and stuff mics him up on the couch laying there in the studio and that's the track that you hear the guitar vocal that you hear in that song it's just a beautiful song again I got a goosebumps alert twice now um but the Anyway, that's not related to this video, sort of, kind of, but not really. So in this video, I want to talk about mixing, specifically one thing to make sure you do before you dive in and start mixing. I've talked about this before, but it keeps coming up, and I want to keep uh, reiterating this point because it's really, really important and helpful. So in my five-step mixing process, the first step is the setup, and I have a certain way that I like to set up my mixing sessions. Step two is the static mix, which is, I've talked about that a lot. It's this idea of let's just get the levels right before we start using plugins. Let's make sure that the level of all the drums are balanced together, and then let's make sure the overall drums are balanced against the bass, and so on and so forth for everything in the song, so that we get it sounding as good as possible without plugins. Then we start adding the plugins. And step three is where we start adding those plugins by um, fixing any big problems we hear in the mix. And it's that between step two and three, there's a big transition that has to happen. And I think for a lot of people, first of all, a lot of people will skip over that step. They will open up the mix, push the faders up, and start grabbing plugins and tweaking sounds. And it's not technically wrong. It's just from experience and from talking to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of mixers over the years, um, it doesn't yield great results because you end up working in a silo of soloing the kick drum, listening to kick drum for 30 minutes to an hour, and then you go back to the whole mix, and what sounded great by itself doesn't sound all that good in the mix, or doesn't sound any better. So we need to think of things in the context of the mix. So in my mixing course, I talk a lot about zooming out to hearing the entire mix, and then figuring out where we're going to go, then zooming in to the drums and then if we need to more zoom into the snare drum and zoom into the EQ of the snare drum, but then we have to, every time we zoom in, we've got to make sure we're pretty quickly afterward zooming back out, at least to the previous level, if not all the way back out. So maybe I'm working on the snare EQ, then I zoom out to the overall drum mix with all the drums, then I zoom out to the entire mix and see how the changes I just made affect the entire mix, because that's what really matters. But we need all those different states, right? I need to listen to the snare in solo sometimes to hear what's happening, so I I can know what needs to happen next. Um, so that's part of what is kind of happening in the background during step two, which is the static mix. As we're pushing faders up and we're soloing to see what that sounds like, and then we're unsoloing and putting it in its place, both in the level up and down and in the stereo spectrum, left and right, up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, B, A, select, start. It's two selects if you're going to play two-player. Anyway, um, while you're doing that, you're getting to listen to the tracks and see what's happening. And for me, I realize there's a kind of unspoken kind of step to A that happens, which is what bothers you about the raw tracks? So this isn't a get it right at the source talk. I've done plenty of those and I'll do plenty more, I'm sure. But as you're moving things up and you listen to the drum mix by itself and then the overall mix together, what are you hearing that's not right? That isn't the way it should be in the final mix. Sometimes that's a thing that needs to be re-recorded, get it right at the source, but a lot of times it's just this bass guitar has too much low mid-range, I'm going to need to EQ that out to get it to sit right in the mix. Um, those overheads are too boomy, I'm going to need to make note to kind of clean those up in the low end to work with my kick drum and the overheads and the, the room mics and all that. Um, so these are the kind of things that we think about, but I think the problem is people get so excited to grab their latest plug-in that they got and to slap it on everything and to start moving knobs around that they don't stop to think, well, why am I doing this to begin with, right? What problem am I trying to solve with this tool? 
And if we don't know the problem we're trying to solve, we're going to do a lot of spinning our wheels. You're going to take forever on a mix, and it's not going to be any better than it was at the beginning. So that's why I honestly uh, thought about the idea of doing a five-step mix guide was stupid. Honestly, for a long time, I thought you can't put this into a step-by-step process. But I realized you can in the sense of what are the big phases of a mix, Like, when you get through with this phase, we can move on to this next phase. And eventually, the final phase is, now I know my mix is done. And I realize a lot of people have a hard time getting from here to there. And one of the places where people get hung up is maybe they do the static mix and they don't know where to go for step three, which is fixing those big problems. And that is a listening process. You have to get better at listening in order to get better at this process, which means you got to learn listen to your music that you listen to and pay attention to what is a great sounding drum mix sound like? What is a great vocal sound like? And then what's the difference between that vocal over there and this vocal right here? You may not know, but can you put into words or formulate, at least in your mind, what differences are there? Is one brighter than the other? Is one louder than the other? Does one seem to have a lot of compression over the other? Um, Where does the level of each sit? How does a vocal sit on your favorite record over the instrument? Is it buried? Is it right on top? Is it out in front? Does it have a lot of reverb? Does it not have a lot of reverb? Does it have a lot of low end? Does it not? Does it have a lot of high end? Is it very mid rangey or is it kind of scooped in the mids? Make note of all of that. And then when you go to pull up your vocal, you'll hear, ah, my vocal has too much mid range, too much dynamic, and it's not quite bright enough. Guess what? You just gave yourself a little to-do list of things to do on that vocal. We're going to EQ out the mid-range, we're going to compress it a little bit, and then we're going to do a nice little gentle boost in the top end to give it some air, right? We know that because we're fam- we've familiarized ourselves with what a good vocal sounds like, and then we have to look at our vocal and decide what needs to change to take it from here to there. Now, you can't intuitively know, especially if you're just starting out, maybe how to get from here to there, right? But the first step really isn't to throw plugins and just guess You can, and you might happen upon the answer occasionally, but the real skill there is knowing what the sound sounds like, being able to kind of articulate that, and then what the sound needs to sound like. And you base that on all the great music that's been produced in the last hundred years. That's the beauty of living in an age of Spotify and Apple Music and instant access to any music that you want. There's plenty of downside. There's lots of controversy around those tools, but if we're honest, I can listen to anything right now. With a few clicks, I can go pull up Led Zeppelin and get that, hear what that guitar tone was right now. I don't have to go find a record and put it on the record player. Even I don't have to leave this chair to get a reference of what a great guitar tone is for like a blues rock song. It's right there waiting for me in my computer. So instead of having to just guess, I know I can listen and do my research, so to speak, by just listening to good music and making note of what's happening within all of the different pieces of the mix. The best mixers in the world have laid their secrets out in front of us. This is what a good mix sounds like. They can't hide that because the mix has to be released to the public. Now, they may not tell you exactly what plugins they used and what settings they used, but they're telling you this is what the great end result needs to sound like. And then you can go try to emulate that. Now, I'm making it sound simpler than it actually is, but in some ways, this is both. It's a simple process and a complex process, right? Um, math can be simple and it can be complicated, but it it's still, that's a bad example. Math is a bad example, but playing guitar is both simple and complicated. There are only 12 notes on this instrument right? There are only a handful of chords, and then within each key, there's only a handful of chords that work in that key. You know what I mean? So in some ways, yes, it's complicated, and there are infinite number of variations, but also it's fairly simple. It's kind of the same way here with mixing. Develop your ears first. Make sure that's a part of your process of learning, and then as you learn different tricks for how to EQ and how to compress and how to use reverb and how to do all these other fun things, you'll have a context in which to put that oh, I'm doing that to achieve that sound, which I've heard in that record. Now I have a better idea of how to take my raw snare drum and get it to sound like this snare drum because I use these tricks I learned from Joe Gilder and Graham Cochran and Dave Pensato. Does that make sense? But until you learn to hear the differences between this and this, the in-between doesn't really matter. Okay? All right, that's it for this video. I know uh, maybe this isn't the kind of thing you want to hear, but it's good advice. Don't shoot the messenger. By the way, if you haven't checked out my five-step mix guide and you want to see it and read it in its entirety, it's absolutely free. Just head to homestudiocorner.com slash free and you can see all the free guides there. Five-step mixing guide being one of them. Thanks for watching. See ya.